Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like Jordan Millwood. Thanks, Millie. You're wrong about Helium-3. Probably. But not in the way you might think. Helium-3 is an isotope of helium that's ideal for nuclear fusion, an isotope being an atom with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Helium-3 has an atomic mass of 3, hence the name. Nuclear fusion is the opposite of the fission process that currently powers the world's nuclear reactors. Two small nuclei are squashed together with enough energy that they fuse into one larger nucleus, but the resulting larger nucleus actually has a lower mass than the sum of its parts. This so-called mass defect is converted into energy, with the amount of energy released described by an equation you probably haven't heard of. This is all stuff that your average armchair nuclear physicist already knows, but this is the point where the misconceptions start forming. I can already hear comments being typed along the lines of, why would you fuse helium-3 when way more abundant fusion fuels such as isotopes of hydrogen are easier to fuse and release more energy? Therein lies the point of this video. There seems to be this strange notion that quote unquote energy is a tangible thing. That energy has to take a form, and some forms are considerably easier to convert into electricity than others. With regard to fusing deuterium and tritium, hydrogen isotopes with one and two neutrons respectively, that energy is kinetic, with most of it being imparted into a fast-moving neutron. Getting useful energy out of neutron radiation is not only extremely difficult, but also extremely dangerous. If you couldn't already tell from the name, neutrons have no charge and are therefore unaffected by electric or magnetic fields. The only way to extract useful energy out of them is for them to whack into a so-called blanket surrounding the reactor and heat it up, which can then be used to heat water, to make steam, to turn a turbine, yada yada, you did all the rest in school. It seems humans are forever locked in a quest to find the most efficient way to boil water that spins something. However, not only is this process extremely inefficient, but neutron radiation makes materials highly radioactive. At the end of the reactor's life, you'd be saddled with literal tons of radioactive waste to dispose of, and hey, I've seen this one! It's all the same problems fission reactors have, just even more expensive. Not to mention the fact that we haven't created a self-sustaining fusion reaction that produces more energy than was put in yet. Thanks to how inefficient the energy conversion is, that yet-to-be-achieved break-even point has to be exceeded a hundred times over to get more electricity out than is being put in. We'll put a pin in that for now because the scale of that problem deserves its own video. Another issue with deuterium-tritium fusion that I never see mentioned is that there's no way to stop some of the deuterium fusing with itself. Despite this reaction producing less than a quarter the energy and further sapping the overall reactor efficiency, proponents of these types of reactors actually pitch this as an advantage. It has a 50-50 chance of either producing tritium, which is good as it's the considerably rarer of the two fuels, or the subject of this video, helium-3, which I promise we'll get back to soon, but this context is important. The plasma isn't hot enough for helium-3 fusion to start happening, so it's considered an impurity and needs to be extracted. Separating the helium from the hydrogen is energy intensive, not to mention then separating out different helium isotopes. This further reduces the reactor's efficiency and only produces micrograms of helium-3 per fuel cycle. So what makes helium-3 so much more attractive as a fusion fuel? Helium-3 fusion is a neutronic. If you fuse helium-3 with deuterium, most of the products are charged particles, which can be contained and controlled with powerful magnets. Direct energy conversion of the charged particles can be used to produce electricity, which can achieve efficiencies of up to 80%. When you realize helium-3 fusion requires two to three times as much energy to achieve as hydrogen fusion, but is almost three times as efficient without producing radioactive waste or dangerous radiation, it starts to make a lot of sense. Although you still run into the same problem with deuterium fusing with itself, this reaction produces about 1% the number of neutrons generated by a deuterium-tritium reaction. But going one step further, you can actually fuse helium-3 with itself, which only produces charged products, none of which are radioactive. There are no pesky neutrons damaging the reactor and producing radioactive waste. When scientists speak of nuclear fusion being the holy grail of energy production, this is the reaction they're talking about. So why aren't we fusing helium-3 already? There are two key problems. Firstly, helium-3 is extremely rare on Earth. Yes, you can produce it using hydrogen fusion, but not only does this have all the problems previously mentioned, but the energy you could get out of the helium-3 produced versus the energy required to generate it in the quantities you'd need simply doesn't break even. I would love to be wrong about this. The fusion startup Helion claims that their patented fuel cycle will be able to produce all the helium-3 they need and still break even, but they're not without their critics. It's equivalent to burning a forest to power a machine that makes synthetic oil, when you could just mine the oil instead. Where could we mine helium-3? 
I'm sure you know where this is going, but it is, of course... <laughs> Instead of producing helium-3 in artificial reactors, why not just use helium-3 produced by the natural fusion reactor right there in the sky above us and deposited on the lunar surface by the solar wind? The lunar regolith is estimated to contain a million metric tons of helium-3. For context, just 20 tons of helium-3 could meet the energy demand of the entire United States for a year. The energy produced would be up to 270 times greater than the amount required to extract it and transport it back to Earth, a ratio that producing it with deuterium fusion reactors simply can't hope to match. This is why mining helium-3 on the moon has been such a staple of science fiction for decades, and why saying just make it on Earth or fuse hydrogen instead is not the slam dunk some folks seem to think it is. No shade, Space Doc, I love your content, but you're wrong. The thing is, although the moon has a lot of helium-3, concentrated in the roughly 20% of the surface covered by the Lunar Maria, it's spread incredibly thin and buried in the top few meters of regolith. You can't simply land on the moon, dig up a chunk of helium-3 and fly back to Earth. For lunar mining to be economically viable, you would need vast infrastructure and a permanent human presence there to process the sheer quantity of regolith required to produce even a small amount of helium-3. I'm sorry, did someone just say permanent human presence? Well, wow, that's like taking the political stuff that happens here on Earth and putting it in space, which is like both the things I'm most interested in talking about. How did you get in here? You see, not only is the moon a great place to get helium-3, but if you want to build any sort of sizable infrastructure in the solar system, like, say, a Mars colony, we're kind of lucky to have this massive hunk of low-gravity rocks just hanging around in a close orbit. Well, relatively close at least. So not only is there an economic incentive to colonize the moon, but once the right infrastructure is set up on the lunar surface, the rest of the solar system is practically at our fingertips. Well, within reason. True, but the thing about becoming a multiplanetary species is that we probably won't be doing it as some sort of united Earth. There will not be one of these factories on the moon, but perhaps an American factory, and a Chinese factory, and maybe an Indian factory. But it begs the question of how the politics and the political systems of the right now world will inevitably extend into the not actually that far into the future world. So, are you saying you've made a video about that? Yes I have. And you also appear in that video in one of these cameo bits. So you, the audience, can click on my video, then go back to this video, and then do that over and over again to simulate being in a time. Sorry about that, I don't know where he came from. See you on my channel. Where was I? As well as requiring a level of lunar colonization we won't achieve for another century at the least, helium-3 fusion has another major challenge. With both fusion reactants having double the charge, the energy required to fuse helium is considerably higher than hydrogen. The theory has been sound for decades, but we need a much greater understanding of plasma dynamics before we can reliably create and sustain such a reaction. One of the biggest surprises on my degree was learning just how little we understand plasma. It isn't even properly understood why Hall effect ion thrusters work. Seriously, they shouldn't work, which is why they're so hard to design and scale up. Put a pin in that because it's a topic for yet another video. Fusing helium-3 is primarily an engineering challenge. That's why fusion research is so important and the development of hydrogen reactors is a key stepping stone to achieving the dream of limitless clean energy. But hydrogen fusion is not the fulfillment of that dream, and even that is decades away from becoming a reality. Fusion research is absolutely worth investing in, but it isn't the silver bullet to solve our near-term energy problems. Why pin all of our hopes on spending decades trying to recreate the sun in a reactor when we can already harness the sun's energy directly? Helium-3 is a miracle fuel, but one for the next century, not the one we live in. It isn't a pointless venture, but it also isn't the solution to all our current problems. And that's why, until you clicked on this video, you were probably wrong about it. A massive thank you to Kanubis for his segment. Be sure to go check out his accompanying video on how humanity will colonize the solar system. If you think I'm wrong, let me know in the comments below and let's get a discussion going. I didn't even get around to mentioning alternatives like PB fusion, but that stuff's pretty boring. And that's where I'm ending this video on that pun. A massive thank you to my patrons and donators for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the amazing steak, Dakota Clark, Olaf Hammerhand, Madsor, Peter Lushtinets, Simone67, Lady Lagzalot, Scott Milligan, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Jordan Millwood, Darth Malakor, Frosty Moon, and Dommy Martin Glogie.